Well, let's then start with the actual argument that Descartes is making in the meditations. And Descartes starts with one basic premise. And that is, how do I know that anything exists at all? How do I know anything at all? Maybe nothing exists. And he's looking for that indisputable starting point to have a kind of very scientific approach to, to his philosophy. Now, I, I want to say I've had, you know, in the book that I wrote, in Defense of the True, the Good and the Beautiful, uh, I, which is it's largely a kind of chronological look at the three transcendentals and saying, how, what did classical philosophy believe about it? And then how do we move away from it? Um, you know, I've had people <clears throat> who read that book saying, okay, I, I get, you know, the overview and it is an overview text, but, uh, but why is it, what I don't see is why, why would anyone shift to the modern view? Like what was appealing about modern philosophy? Because when you, when you look at kind of the conclusions, it seems like that that's weird that people would move to the skepticism. So like what, what was the motive for shifting away? Uh, was it, just arbitrary. We don't want to know things. <laughs> I want to live in absolute skepticism. Like, no, I mean, I think what we find with Descartes is the motive is now it is to have a more sure philosophical system that would have an indisputable starting point. So we don't start with skepticism to live in skepticism. With Hume, we have that kind of ultimate skepticism because he sees that as a logical conclusion of where Descartes starts. But Descartes is not just trying to say, I want to like live in a world where we don't know anything. Um, <laughs> he thinks that he's actually going to have a more certain philosophy because he's going to be starting with an indisputable point in a way that the classical Greeks didn't. So he's trying to have a more scientific approach, and he believes that this is actually going to lead to a more logically rigorous and a, a more clear philosophy that's going to show us what is actually real and, and what is not. So that's that's where we start. Now, I think what happens as we move on, as we'll see, is that through the questions Descartes poses, it does ultimately lead to a skepticism on, a, on the part of many philosophers because they're not going to find the answers to the questions that he himself poses as being all that compelling. So it's going to, to lead then to um, a... a an acceptance of Descartes' questioning, but not an acceptance of his answers. So that's how you get to the skeptical point. So you have to see that as the foundation. And if you don't see Descartes as the foundation, and this primarily as the the goal of what they're trying to do, you're not really going to understand modern philosophy following, uh, following Descartes. All right, so he's asking, how do I know that anything exists? Looking for this indisputed starting point for his system. And you know, he says, well, okay, we, we may look around us and just assume that things exist, right? I see things around me. I see the computer screen right now that I'm looking at as I'm looking at this PowerPoint. Uh, and, you know, I, I heard the garbage truck drive by <laughs> a little bit ago just before I started recording. So I'm hearing things. Now I hear the sound of my own voice. I, you know, I have my, my sense experience of this stuff around me that certainly seems like it's real. So I may assume that it's real. But is it indisputable that it's real? Or is it possible that I could be mistaken that what I'm seeing is real? So we have some other options before us. Well, perhaps the things that I'm experiencing right now are really just a dream. How do I know that it's not a dream? You've probably had dreams that are very realistic. I've had dreams that are quite realistic. You know, those dreams where you just kind of wake up and, and think, oh, wait, did that really happen? And then you have to kind of kind of get back in your in your life and in and, and your head and, and start to come to a realization of, wait a minute, that wasn't real. That was a dream. You know, you get these very re realistic dreams. So how do I know that it isn't just a, you know, that I'm not living in a dream right now? And yeah, I know people actually have answers to this where they would say, you know, you can't read well in a dream. There are certain things you can't do in a dream. You can't like pinch your nose and stop breathing in a dream. Uh, and I don't know how well those kind of things actually, actually work in dreams. But, you know, perhaps that's the case of most dreams, but what if this dream is the one exception to that? How would I know? Can I make a universal judgment that I can't read well in dreams? I can say it's my experience is generally true, but not always. So I can't definitively prove that my existence in my life right now is not a dream. Uh, but you know, we have a, that's not the only solution either. So it, it might not it might not be that that it's a dream. Um, Perhaps the world was, and I mentioned this before, perhaps the world was created five minutes ago. And this is something that I can't really prove. I can't prove to you the world wasn't created five minutes ago. How am I going to do that? I, can I, I can't take a time machine and travel back 
six minutes ago to prove that it existed then. And even if I were to grab a time machine and take you back in a time machine to six minutes ago, uh, how do I know that that actually existed before and it wasn't just created afterwards as it was traveling in my time machine? You know, there's no way to actually prove it. So perhaps the world is brand new and all of the things that I take for granted in my life are just, were just implanted in my head. They're just implanted memories. So they're just, you know, all the memories of my childhood and the things that I did and everything about my family, it's all just been implanted in my head and it feels real to me, but it's not any more real than a fictional narrative, uh, than, a, than a novel or a, you know, video game story or a TV show or something else. Um, or... We could think of the idea that like you're maybe you're just you're insane. You, you've got mental problems. We, we know that it's possible for people with certain mental uh, issues to see things that, that aren't there. Uh, you know, you and I think of like being a kid in cartoons. There was always like the scene where somebody's in a desert and they see the mirage. Right. And they see like a, you know, cart that's full of like sodas to give out to people that are that are thirsty when you're kind of delusional now i don't know how much the mirage thing actually works but but at least to some extent uh we we are our minds are able to make up things that we think are real uh here's a great example of this is in like recovered memory therapy um this is for a long time or for a time at least it was a common practice for some psychologists to use hypnotism as a way to recover memories of childhood that were suppressed. Well, that led to a lot of interesting results. People started to remember things like, you know, alien abductions. This is how that phenomenon became really popular. And, you know, um, SRA, if you know what that is, um, and some other things, uh, that these these things discovered that were recovered in these memory therapies, people began to realize are actually not really true. You're, you're basically, when you're hypnotizing somebody, you, you end up kind of creating these memories by the questions you're asking. But oftentimes the person, the people can actually believe that those memories are real, even if they're not actually real, they didn't experience those things. So you can create trauma that never existed, which is kind of a, a horrible thing. So recovered memory therapy. And yeah, I know that there are a few, people who still practice it, but the majority of the psychiatric profession recognizes that, uh, that there's a danger in doing that because, well, maybe perhaps you can recover some memories. I mean, I don't know, and, and it's not really quite clear that you can, but even if you can, it's also become pretty clear that you can implant false memories in people's heads. Okay, so perhaps that's what happens. Uh, well, nowadays, the, the, the answer to this probably would be like, well, maybe we're all living in a simulation. And that's very popular. Elon Musk likes to say we're living in a simulation. All sorts of people like to say that reality is just a simulation. We're just in a video game or something. And so in the fullest sense, it's not actually real. Now, Descartes goes through a bunch of, of different options here. Uh, and eventually he says, well, maybe there is, you know, even if you can say it's not a dream, because even if you can be like, okay, well, this logically doesn't make sense with a dream. You know, what if, and you can go to these kind of wild scenarios. He says, what if there's this evil genie that's manipulating your head? What if there is this just monstrous demonic creature that is just torturing you just for fun and wants you to experience all of these things as real, but they're not actually real. And this evil genie is much more powerful than you are. And if he's much more powerful than you are, he can make things seem more real than they are in real life because he's that powerful and he's that manipulative and crazy. So perhaps all of us are really just being manipulated by an evil genie. Uh, and perhaps there are not all of us. There is just one of us. And that is Descartes. That's what he's reasoning in his own head. Okay. So he's saying, well, how, how do I know that I am not being manipulated to believe in this external world around me by this, some kind of evil creature? Well, in this process, as he's asking all of these different kinds of questions and going through scenarios, he comes to the conclusion that, well, there is one thing that I know. And that is that in these questions and in this questioning that I'm doing, he says, I know that I exist because I know that I'm the one that's doubting my existence. So this is where you have that famous phrase, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Now, sometimes philosophers just summarize this as the cogito because it's so famous, it's so well known. And so he says, if I'm doubting, one thing I do know is that there is doubting taking place, so I am, I am actually doubting. 
If there is doubting, there has to be a doubter, and I'm a doubter. Now, that conclusion, and this is because Descartes sees this as this indisputable foundation. This is what he's looking for, right? This sure, objective, clear, absolute truth, truth foundation to move forward from. David Hume is going to challenge that and say, how do you know? That doesn't prove that you exist. That doesn't follow. All you're saying is that there is a sensation of doubting happening. You're not, you don't have a way to prove that there is actually an I that is doubting. You just have the, the sense that there is an I. You just have a sense that you're an I. But perhaps the sense of a unified I or a unified self is no more real than your sense of the external world. The only thing you can know is that there is a sensation of doubting. But you can't come to a conclusion that there is a self that's actually involved in the sensation. So that's that's going to be the criticism of Hume, and that's how you end up with this kind of total skepticism. But Descartes thinks that he has found this clear foundation. So we see then that the foundation of all knowledge becomes our own self-knowledge. So knowledge then begins for Descartes with knowledge of the self. It is knowledge, I am, I exist in my own experience, and then I move forward from my own internal self-knowledge toward the knowledge of, of the world. All right, so then we have the question of, okay, if, if I exist and I know that, and I know that I can doubt, uh, what, what else can I know? Is that the only thing, right? So he's got this, the founding principle, but he's, but he's trying to say, can I then reason from that founding principle that other things exist? Or is he stuck with saying, I'm a skeptic and I can't possibly know anything other than I exist? All right, uh, so we've got then these two first principles to begin with, right? The cogito, cogito ergo sum identifies two things. One is I think, and the other is I exist. So we have essentially two propositions that he's saying are absolutely indisputable propositions that we start with. I think and I exist. Now, what is I? <laughs> that's, that's a major question. If you say I exist, well, what is the I? Because does thinking identify that you exist as body and soul? Not by itself. And here's a major shift that ends up really um, shaping a lot of the way that modern philosophy thinks about thinking or thinks about the human person, the intellect, and ideas. What is I? Well, if the only thing that I know is there's something thinking, and that's what defends the, that's what makes the I, then I am defined as a thinking thing. So what is the I? I am a thinking thing. And that means that I am defined not primarily by my local extension. What I mean by that is my body, my matter, the, the stuff that makes me up. What defines me, it's not, it's not body and soul. It's not body, soul, spirit. Uh, it's not soul or body. It's thinking. The thinking thing is what makes up a person. And this also leads toward a shift in the way that we start thinking about ideas as a whole. Because for Descartes, thinking is about an impression. It's an immediate, in, in the moment, present, conscious activity. So thinking is his own sensation of thinking at that moment, a conscious sensation of doing the thing that is thinking. What shifts there is that in classical philosophy, thinking is defined by a contemplation of universal ideas. So we're talking about something that is not just limited to personal conscious experience at one moment, but we're talking about the nature of the intellect as a whole. So rationality, your, your ability to think through problems, your ability to look at something and interpret it. But for Descartes, thinking is not about this connection with universal ideas, but it's about conscious moment right now, I feel that I am thinking. And that leads toward a shift in, in philosophy, but also in, in theology as well, significantly, that no longer are we thinking about revelation later on in, in, in Christian theology in terms of an objective thing that has been revealed about universal truths or the nature of history. A revelation becomes the immediate contact of God with the conscious thinking mind. That's what you find at somebody like a Friedrich Schleiermacher, but also with Rudolf Bultmann uh, in, in the 20th century. And plenty of other people do something similar to that. So instead of this, there's not this focus on these universal things. He's, he doesn't he's not really a realist. 
Descartes is basically coming from that nominalist perspective. So when he's thinking about how the mind works, we're not connecting to universals. We're just, we have a conscious experience of what's happening around us or in our own heads. Um, he is, he's, he's an idealist in his starting point rather than an empiricist, uh, which means that ideas are the first reality, the ultimate reality rather than experience. So our knowledge comes through, through thought rather than our experience, our sense experience, meaning our, you know, our, our taste, uh, touch, sight, how we experience the world with our bodies. Um, so uh, instead, we start with the realm of ideas, the ideas that we have. Now, he's not going to dismiss conscious experience by any means. And later from Descartes, we have these clearer divides into the idealists and the empiricists or rationalists and empiricists, where you have a kind of battle between those who are looking at sense experience and those who are arguing for uh, universal intellectual propositions and, and deductive reasoning as the way to find truth. So you have like Hume is, is a, uh, for example, an empiricist. And then you have Kant who's, who kind of tries to blend both things together. Um, and then you have, you know, German idealism, which is Kant, but then you also have Hegel uh, la later on. Okay. Um, so from deductive reasoning, what, what Descartes is then going to argue, so he's going to say, I know I exist. And I am a thinking thing. Thinking is a conscious activity that I have. There is thinking and there is myself. And how then do we get to the existence of the external world? Or can we? Well, he doesn't move from the I to the external world. He's got a step between that, which is the existence of God. So he's going to make an argument. He's going to make a couple different arguments, largely one argument. But he's going to make an argument that God exists. And that argument is going to be based on what he knows from those two first principles. And so he believes then that he has now created a third indisputable principle, which is that God exists. So I think I exist, God exists. Once he comes to that perspective, he discusses the nature of God. Is God good? If God is perfect, God must be good because goodness implies or perfection implies goodness to be good is to is better than to be bad so to be perfect you have to be good or the ultimate good if we do believe that god is the ultimate good right if god is perfect that means that we can trust that he would not deceive us so if i am created by a perfect being that is god that means that the devil scenario or the genie scenario that i just we talked about before doesn't really have a leg to stand on. We don't have this evil genie in charge of all things. We have a good God that is in charge of all things. And that means that that God wouldn't deceive us like the evil genie would. So therefore, we can generally rely on our senses to point us to reality. So Descartes, though he begins with skepticism, comes to this indisputable principle, two indisputable principles, then adds the third, which is God's existence. From God's existence, now he reasons that I can rely on my sense experience. So the point is what Descartes comes out of here, uh, he comes out from skepticism with a general reliability about the nature of the world. So where Descartes ends is not in this position of we don't really know anything or we just have to stay in our heads. He, he He's trying to have an indisputable proof about the existence of the natural world, about our, our experiences of the natural world really being something that points us to reality. But the question is then, does he actually make that argument strongly enough? <laughs> uh, is the argument for God's existence and then the existence of the natural world based on God's existence, is that really strong enough to make a definitive case? And many are going to say no. So let's do a quick review of the uh, overview of the proof for God's existence. We've got two proofs here. They're very much related that Descartes uses in this text. And in some ways, he's really building on Anselm's ontological argument. Uh, in short, if I could summarize Anselm's ontological argument, uh, he and Saint Anselm, uh, you know, medieval scholastic uh, theologian, he says he defines God as that than which nothing greater can be conceived. That's the starting point. Anselm then goes on to say, well, it it is better to exist. Than not to exist. And if God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived, certainly an existing thing is greater than a non-existing thing. Therefore, by definition, God exists because to be 
greater than anything else is necessarily to have existence. So he tries to make an argument from the definition of God that God must exist. Now, there are many responses to Anselm's argument. There are defenses. There's a, new, a modal ontological argument that's used by some Catholic analytic philosophers that I think is much stronger than Anselm's original argument. Um, plenty of people have just dismissed it and said they're this is, this is just a really bad argument. We're not going to get into any of that right now. Um, what Anselm was really trying to do is, is trying to say, can I make an argument for God's existence apart from my observation of the natural world? And, and that's what he comes up with. Um, so from Descartes, then, we do see a move away from the cl many of the classical arguments for God's existence. Because the classical arguments for God's existence often use our, our experience of the world as a foundation for God's existence. But for Descartes, we can't even assume our experience of the world corresponds to anything real. Uh, they often use Aristotle's notion of what a cause is, which Descartes has thrown out because he has basically a mechanistic approach to the world. And if that's the case, you've kind of gotten rid of a lot of the classic arguments for God's existence, really, except for the ontological argument. And since for Descartes, everything starts in the head, it kind of makes sense that he would use the ontological argument in some way. So you could do with these proofs what you want. Uh, I'm not going to give an evaluation of them, but this is this Descartes finds them compelling, and, and many following Descartes did not find them so compelling, but this is what he says. Uh, you know, the first proof, you know, he says, Descartes says, he's an imperfect being. But this imperfect being, that is Descartes, has an idea in his own head of perfection. Now, a, a less perfect being is, has less formal reality than a perfect being. And so the question is then, how could an imperfect being have an innate idea in his head of perfection if that did not actually exist? So I cannot conceive of something that is far greater than what I am. Right? I can conceive of, of things that are within my own intellectual grasp. So I generally uh, can conceive of things that are uh, on equal par with me or lesser than me. How can I conceive of something that is far more, infinitely more perfect and real than I am by myself, by an imperfect being? So he's going to say that this innate idea must therefore come from a perfect being. The second proof, this is a causal proof, but it's largely kind of a reformulation of the ideas here and a defending point uh, here. He says, you know, he, so he goes through some scenarios. He's like, well, what if I was the cause of my own existence? And he says, well, if I was the cause of my own existence, he says, I would have given myself perfections, <laughs> but I don't have those perfections because I, I have doubt and I'm unsure and I know I make bad decisions sometimes. Uh, so I know that I couldn't have come up with, I couldn't be the cause of my own existence because I would have given myself perfections. And it still doesn't explain where the idea of perfection would even come from. Um, so he's not able to give himself the idea of perfection because it's not something that he has experience of. He only has experience of his own imperfection. And now he says, well, what about my parents? You know, his parents, his grandparents, his ancestors, maybe they, they caused him. Well, if they were the cause of his existence, they too must have had the idea of perfection because somehow they passed on the idea of perfection to him. And But he knows that they too are not were not perfect beings. They too are imperfect, therefore they could not give the idea of perfection. So therefore he thinks that the very idea of perfection itself only logically can come uh, from a a perfect being. So that's that's the essence of Descartes' primary arguments for the existence of God. Now, as I said, many people don't necessarily find these arguments particularly compelling, and you know that's that's fine. Descartes finds them compelling, uh, but what what happens after Descartes is because people don't find those arguments themselves compelling. Now, if you have to have this kind of proof for the existence of God in this particular way that Descartes is arguing to have knowledge of the material world, which is what he does, right? He says that we only know the material world because we know we have a perfect God and we can rely on, on him to have to not deceive us. So that depends on his argument, not just his idea that God exists, but also that God is perfect and wouldn't deceive us. So if, if, it's, if that argument that he's making logically is on shaky ground, if it's a questionable argument then therefore you've collapsed the foundation under which we know anything at all. And that's the problem that's going to happen after Descartes is people are, are not always going to be convinced by his arguments for God's existence. But with his starting point, they then say, well, do, how do I actually know that the external world exists? Maybe not, because I'm not compelled by what Descartes says about this, the existence of this perfect being. 
All right, so then we also have another idea that shows up in Descartes that's really significant to modern uh, philosophy and modern constructions as well of, of the relationship between body and, and soul. So we have this question of the relationship between the internal world of the conscious mind and the physical thing that we are. So he has defined man already in the beginning of his argument as a thinking thing. So we're defined by our thinking. Well, thinking is a mental property which is distinct from a physical property. Therefore, if I'm identical with my thinking, what is this physical stuff that I have? <laughs> well, ultimately, when he comes to the conclusion that God exists and therefore God would would give us, would not deceive us, he would give us you know, a, a reliable uh, sense experience that means that we can generally trust that our body is real too because God wouldn't deceive us by making us all think we had bodies that we don't actually have. Um, okay, so... So that's there. We have um, the, the the nature of the body as being real, but it's not definitive of of who we are. Um, so mental properties, and when we talk about properties, this is something that a lot of contemporary philosophy of mind is going to deal with. But this is largely kind of analytic philosophy is often talking about properties, different kinds of, of properties. So we have mental properties, and we have physical properties. Um, you know, physical properties and mental properties are significantly distinct. And so a, you know, a, a for example, a medical or a, a medical mental property could be, you know, the, think about the property of a thought versus the property of, say, a physical state of the brain. Um, you know, if you are talking about, say, a physical brain state, and you, you have a certain thought, and corresponding to that thought, you've got some kind of reaction going on in some part of the brain. If you're talking about what's going on in terms of physical things, you can ask a question about the physical nature of a thing that is different from the mental property. So you could say something like, well, where is that happening? Well, and you could point to like where the, the thing is in the brain that's, that's going on, you know, where the activity in the brain actually is. If you say of a thought, where is that? That doesn't make sense because that's the, the where is not something that is a mental property, it is a physical property. So even though it could be related to the thought, it is not identical with the thought. If you are speaking about a thought, you can say, is that true or false? Right? If I'm thinking about a proposition. Now, if we're thinking about the nature of the brain state, you can't you can ask the question, I guess, of of what's going on in your brain, of just the physical interaction to say, is that true or false? Well, it's just a physical interaction. It's just the that. It's a thing that happens. It's not true or false. But because that's not a physical question, that is a, a question of a mental property rather than a physical property. So they have very different essences, very, very different um, questions that can be asked about them. And there is this principle of identity in philosophy, which says that if you can ask if if A and B are identical, then every single thing that is true of A is also true about B in exactly the same way. And if everything is everything that is true about B is also true about A in the same way, and everything that is false, it, it goes the, the same way. Anything that's false about A has to also be false about B, and anything that's false about B can also be false about A. Uh, and if we're talking about something like the physical brain and a mental property and or brain state or uh, mental states or thoughts. They can't be absolutely identical because we have things that can be said of one that can't be said of another. So there, I think those are actually very powerful arguments. So those arguments are also are used today to defend a, a kind of dualism, to argue that the mental and physical are not identical. A lot of philosophers of mind make these arguments. And uh, so Richard Swinburne, for example, is a brilliant British philosopher. Uh, got plenty of disagreements with Swinburne, but his book on substance dualism, where he defends Descartes' approach to dualism, is a really excellent defense of the distinction between the mental and the physical. So there are philosophers doing uh, very intensive work trying to build upon Descartes' arguments here. So Descartes himself doesn't get into as many extensive arguments as have happened now, but he did lay the foundation for, for a lot of that. So as much as I'm going to disagree with Descartes in his departure from classical philosophy, Descartes has some some pretty compelling argumentation on this particular point 
that I also do believe can be used in conjunction with the classical model of the relationship between body and soul, which is distinct from what we find here in, in Descartes. So they're not always entirely incompatible uh, with, with one another. So we have this problem then that we've got mental properties, physical properties that are so different. So we have a, the, the mental things and the physical things that are, he would say, two separate substances. And he is going to define a substance as a thing that can exist without another thing. So in other words, he can say, at least theoretically, the mind can exist without the body and the body can exist without the mind. And you have thought experiments philosophers use today to make the same arguments. People talk about uh, philosophical zombies, which are just bodies that walk around and do things and act like normal bodies, but they don't actually have any internal conscious experience. Uh, you also have the, you know, the thought experiment of, you know, can you separate, are you, the question of, are you identical with your body? Well, can you picture yourself, you know, waking up in another body? Could you picture yourself waking up in, say, the body of a, of a bug? And most of us, in fact, pretty much all of us can. And, and how do I know that? Because this is a plot that we use on TV shows constantly and movies where two people switch spots. All of a sudden you're in somebody else's body. Well, the point is that when you're thinking I, you're not thinking body because mentally you have a conception of I can be in another body. In other words, I am not my body. So our, our intuition is to think of ourselves as something other than other than body. So even if it's just in a kind of hypothetical world, you know, is there a possible world in which you could exist without your body? If you are saying yes, there is a possible world in which I exist in a, you know, the body of, you uh, in a computer, say, as people are talking about today, uh, oftentimes that we could kind of just live in a computer or something. Then you're saying that you're not your body. You're identifying yourself with with something else. You're saying you could exist without your body. Your body could theoretically, in in some uh, hypothetical world, your body could exist and act in all the ways that you do without any actual internal conscious experience, like a robot or something. All right. Uh, so you have these two separate substances then of mind and body, of mental and physical. But then you have the fundamental problem with Descartes. And this this is a question that he really does not answer very well. And I think you ultimately, this is the problem with Descartes' substance dualism in my view. And, and I think that dualism is right. Um, from, from I mean, I'm a, I'm a Christian theologian, so I'm going to say that we are both body and soul. These things are both true uh, properties of our existence, of natures of our existence. We, we have both body and soul. Um, but the problem with Descartes' particular formulation, where he defines them as two totally separate substances, is you just have the question of, well, how does the mental interact with the physical? Because if there's two totally kind of divided or separate things, how can a mental thing create a physical action? And this is, is a, a genuine question that people do need to ask today, though, uh, I mean, because if we do have the question of, like, how can I, if I am making a logical deduction in my head, and I use that logical deduction in my head to make a decision about what I'm going to do with the rest of my day, right? If I'm sitting here thinking, what would be the best use of my time? And I'm sitting here, not moving my body, the only things that are going on are going on in my head. And I think through all the logical things of what would be most beneficial for me to do today. And then in my head, I go through those options and make a selection and say, well, that would be the most rational thing for me to do. And then I go out and do it. Well, now I, am, I have had a mental event going on in my brain, uh, in my mind, and that mental event has now led to physical movement. So it's a question of how do those things relate? How can a mental decision or a mental event affect a physical thing? So you have the, the mind-body interaction problem. Uh, and Descartes doesn't really have a great answer to this. Uh, he, he theorizes the, the pineal gland, which is used in all sorts of weird new agey mumbo jumbo is he says maybe a place where you know there's this kind of connecting point in the brain of the of the mind and the body that you know these things kind of come together and join somehow here it's not really much of an answer it's just kind of a, a theorizing uh, Descartes also, when you read about what he thinks about the brain, he tends to be very optimistic about what science is going to find about the brain. I think Descartes, if he were to, you know, 
take a time machine and come into the future to our world today and look at contemporary neuroscience, I think he would be quite surprised at how complicated it is. Uh, he seemed to think that that the number of mathematical formulae would be able to basically explain the brain relatively easily, uh, probably not too far in the future from from his day. Obviously, that is, is not the case. Um, well, the, the reason why this is particularly such a problem for Descartes, this interaction problem, is because he has gotten rid of this notion of teleology. And when you have teleology, say, in, in an Aristotelian perspective, you have properties that are not inherently physical involved in all things that exist to some degree, because all physical things have processes that have goals and purposes and meaning. So for someone like Aristotle, the physical and the, the non-physical or the mental are very much intertwined. You see this, for example, in the idea that you find in Aristotle that plants have a kind of soul and animals have a kind of soul. Their plants have nutritive souls. Uh, humans have rational souls, which distinguish them from plants and animals. But there is a soul in other living things as well. So there isn't this strong just physical versus just mental divide or just soulish or spiritual or whatever term you want to use to describe this. Um, but in Descartes, he has adopted this approach to the world because of, of the developments of the scientific revolution, where he thinks the world basically just operates as a machine as it does. So he's taken out teleology or purpose or souls from the rest of the material world. So where is meaning and purpose? It's no longer in that material world because that's all mechanical, but now it's all interiorized. So you have a very strong kind of uh, mental versus physical divide broadly, which in the human person means all of the meaning and purpose stuff is kind of stuck in my head <laughs> and everything else is just basically a machine. So they're kind of opposed to each other in this way. So you get to this, almost this conception of the the body being this prison that the mind is stuck in. So how exactly does this internal life relate to my external life? Um, and, and that's going to be a, a major problem for Descartes. And people do try to give answers to this. And the answers tend to be rather bizarre. And I think the answers show exactly where the problem is. Um, so, you know, you have answers like occasionalism, where God basically creates each moment, moment by moment, to try to make sure that the physical corresponds to the mental. Or that just at the same time that a mental event is going on, a physical event that corresponds to it just happens. So these kind of two parallel tracks that are all running together, uh, you know, at the same time, in the same place, like these trains on two tracks right next to each other, but one is not actually causing the other. They're just doing the same thing at the same time. And that solution to the problem that you see with Descartes, I think, illustrates the problem more than anything else. That there just isn't a strong way to define any interaction between the two. All right. So now we have, uh, to conclude here, we're going to talk about the influence of Descartes. So we've looked at the background of classical philosophy, where Descartes de departs, his basic argument in his meditations. And we've gotten through the major points in Descartes um, he does have, because you may ask about the question of ethics, as we've discussed in plenty of other philosophers, he has some general principles of ethics that he does lay out, but Descartes does not come up with really a comprehensive ethical system. That's not the area that he is highly influential in. He does come up with some basic principles in a kind of logical system, uh, but he doesn't get that far there. So that's why we're not really talking about Descartes' ethics, and he's, he's not particularly influential in the area of ethics. We're going to have to look at other figures for that. All right, so the influence of, of Descartes. What are some things that really shape modern philosophy? W what is the, the impact that he has that really so drastically shifts philosophy into these basically two categories? Right. So when you've got someone studying the history of philosophy, we basically say there's classical philosophy and then there's modern philosophy. And, mo and of course, modern philosophy can be divided up into you know, a million different things, but we, we do strongly distinguish between these two eras and Descartes is that decisive figure where there's the break. So what is that exactly? Well, uh, the first is he sets a new problematic for philosophy. And as I mentioned the problematic earlier, I had a certain set of questions that Greek philosophers asked. 
and that all classical philosophy tried to answer in one way or another. Well, Descartes now has a totally new problematic. He sets the new questions that everyone else is asking after his day. The things that were taken for granted before are no longer taken for granted. The, the questions that had been asked most often before are not really asked so often anymore because it's believed that there are more fundamental questions uh, to be asked instead. So what are these new questions? The first is, how do I know that the material world exists? Right. This is the basis of Descartes' entire system is the question of, do I know anything exists and how do I know it exists? You have some people that are eventually going to say, we don't know that it exists. Or you have, which you have like David Hume, which is a kind of absolute skepticism. I don't know and I can't know that the material world exists. You have someone like Kant who says, we can know it exists, but we can't know what it actually is <laughs> in itself with this noumenal phenomenal realm divide Kant makes. Uh, and then you have other post-Kantians that kind of go back to Hume's argument and say, all we know is our phenomena of our sense experience. We don't know that anything actually does exist. Okay, then you have the question of what is the relationship between between our ideas and then our experience. And this is where you have the later divide between the rationalists and the empiricists. The rationalists focusing on the, the realm of ideas, what's going on in terms of rational deduction, and then the empiricists focusing on the experiences that imprint themselves on us uh, to grow our knowledge. Then you have the third question that we've already discussed a bit, which is how do the mind and body relate to one another? And when I say mind, by the way, mental properties, it doesn't always mean soul. Oftentimes it's a stand-in for soul, but not necessarily so. Okay, then we have the fourth question, which is how does the me a mechanical universe relate to God? So we have this shift away from a teleological view of reality that there are ends and goals and purposes in all things, which clearly relates to God, because not all only do things come from God, but with a final cause, God is also the final cause, which means that all things are from God and flow back to God. So all things begin with him and end with him. So you have this purpose coming from him and going back to him. And here now, when you have a mechanical universe, which is more of just things just are as they are, well, how does God relate to that? How does God relate to a machine that just runs by itself? Like I said, you have the answers of the occasionalists who basically say, well, God actually kind of creates every single moment in the machine. You have the deists who end up saying that God basically created the machine and just lets it run and doesn't really have anything to do with, with the world today. And then, of course, you have others that say that there is no God at all and there just is the mechanical universe and that's all there is to it. Uh, then you have the question related to that, well, does God even exist at all? And that's largely because people did not find Descartes' argument for the existence of God particularly compelling. So then you have uh, kind of rethinking through the arguments for the existence of God, and Descartes has already taken away the foundation for a lot of the classical arguments for God's existence, which do rely on some assumptions that are more Aristotelian. And he's proposed a new one that is not that compelling. And because of that, now you have questions, well, do we know that God exists at all? Um, okay, then we have the new starting point of points of philosophy coming from Descartes. So what are those? Well, uh, first you have this scientific approach to philosophy that begins, begins with these provable first principles. So you have a, an approach to philosophy that tries to be more scientific, that tries to say, okay, well, uh, here is our indisputable definitive starting point, and we're going to build off of this. Uh, probably the, the clearest example of a very scientific kind of philosophy is the modern discipline of analytic philosophy. And I've mentioned that other times in this talk, if you don't know analytic philosophy, it is a very logically rigorous form of philosophy that is that is very popular today. Uh, philosophy today is often divided into uh, the continental philosophy and the analytic philosophy. Uh, so continent be, continental being on the continent of Europe uh, uh, and analytic being more uh, English and, and American. And uh, continental philosophy is is not just concerned with logical formulation. It's more, and this is where you get the postmodernists and, and post-Marxists and individuals that are thinking through things more broadly in terms of their use of literature and culture and other fields, whereas analytic philosophy tends to be very, very structured to say, well, what's the starting point? What's the logical What's the you know logical conclusion of this, this, and this? Um, so that analytic philosophy in some ways owes its... Uh, development to some of that, the approach that, that uh, Descartes has here. Um, the next point in philosophy is epistemology is central. 
that uh, no longer do we have questions of what is what is reality, but uh, it being at the forefront of philosophy now, we more have those questions of how do I know? How do we know this? How do we know that? How do we know anything? Can we know anything? Perhaps we don't know anything. Uh, those are the epistemological questions, so that becomes central for everybody after this. And then the, the third and final point here is that we begin with the inner self. And again, I don't think that Descartes is purposefully trying to make us all you know, internally introspective, obsessive individualists, but he kind of does. <laughs> you know, that's not what he's trying to do. Uh, but because of that starting point, we do tend to have a philosophy that shifts toward the inner self and inner experience. We see this especially with romanticism and then in existentialism and in a vari uh, variety of ways, even in popular discourse today. Uh, so uh, this was, uh, I know, much more information on Descartes than we've done on most other figures, but he is so foundational and the groundwork and background is so foundational understanding what modern philosophy in the modern world is about that I decided to spend more time here on Descartes than I did on the other figures. If you haven't watched the others in this series, make sure that you do. Make sure you subscribe on the YouTube channel and you can subscribe to the Justin Center podcast on your podcast app. We'll see you in the next one. God bless.